Uh, my name's Brian Dean, and um, I get to play around with space and trying to find new ways for us to kind of reinvent that space. All right, so I work for a company that's called Norvin Nival. I'll bring them back up uh, in a moment. Um, but I want to talk about the learning environment. Um, so many, maybe you went to a session yesterday, or maybe you've heard this idea that your learning environment becomes your third teacher, right? And really, that's great to a certain extent, but, but it's pretty ambiguous. So when we start talking about learning environments, one of the big pieces that really comes up to me are kind of these tenets. Learning design and space design are inherently human-centered design. The space, inherently the space that you're in has to have some, it, it's a living space, right? Because a lot of the pieces that move through it are humans. So as we, as we design that space, we have to take into account those individuals. Uh, it's, Real, at Norvin Ivo, we really believe in a 360 degree learning environment. Uh, like there's no front to the room, right? Um, and, and I know that a lot of people are like, well, at some point there's a front to the room. I want to show you some of our renderings as we go through some of the spaces that we've designed and created, kind of show you how that works. Um, and then a well-designed space has the ability to elevate this course, right? It, engage creativity <clears throat> and promote collaboration. I'll show you what we think of those skills are, right? Those are not just, those are not just uh, curriculum skills, they're not knowledge currencies, right? Those are really for exp the exponential age, and then we'll explain that a little bit more. And then finally, th and this is one of my favorites, space is the body language of an organization, right? And when designed with intent, it can contribute to the culture and creativity and collaboration. But it is, it is how you set the stage to move forward. It is how you set the stage to move forward. <clears throat> so, so you guys, how many of you have been out in our interactive learning area? Yeah, for sure, right? How many of you, how many of you fell in love with, with a grassy dome of some kind? Yo, right? It's a beautiful product, but here's the thing about the product. I'm gonna to come to all of these in a moment. Here's the thing about the product, right? It's nice, it's nice to sit on. It brings in this little sense of green into a room. How many of you from the North? I'm from Detroit, y'all. How many other people from Michigan or the North? Yeah, how many of you know about outdoor education? Well, it's like three weeks, right? <laughs> like, it's like three weeks and we're like, we hope, yeah, three and a half if you're lucky, right? And they don't all come together. It's not like three weeks in March. It's like one week in February, another one in maybe May, right? And then one that gets thrown at you in September when the year starts, right? Those are three weeks that you can work outdoors, right? So one of the big pieces about the Grassy Dome is that it starts with working with this idea called biophilia, which is kind of bringing in something that's, that's natural. And how does that change space? But then on top of it, in, in, at Norva Nival, one of the big pieces for us is how do we intentionally design things to do more than one thing? Right, because it doesn't make sense to just throw some gra a grassy dome in a classroom and not have it have other purpose, right? So if you've sat on the grassy dome, how many of you started doing this once you sat in it? First you sat in it, you're like, mmm, I love it, right? And then you started doing this. Right? You started regulating, right? And so, so typically in traditional education, we have that one spot for the student that needs to find some kind of self-regulation, right? And they're, and they're kind of like they're in either emotional dysregulation or sensory dysregulation. And then that becomes their one spot. And that's the unfortunate thing, is that it's just for that student. It becomes a unit tasker, and more importantly, it becomes environmentally exclusive. It's only going to be used for Brian when Brian starts going off the handle, right? Quote, unquote, right? <clears throat> but when you bring in the grassy dome into your classroom, this is no longer just for, just for that one student. It becomes a piece within the class. It builds collaboration around it. We have students on our larger domes that sit around the dome, and they read. And then when they sit around the dome and they're leaning against the dome, the dome might move a little bit, so they're like, yo, I'm gonna need somebody to sit with me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring some people with me to sit around that dome to balance it out, right? Intentionally designed that way, to build and foster that collaboration and community, right? It's light, all our furniture's super light. I'm gonna pick it up, throw it at somebody. Just kidding. Not gonna throw it at you, you look a little scared, it's cool. <laughs> but it's super light. Right? And the reason why it's so light is because we have a belief that every, every classroom should have ownership by the learners. Every classroom should be learner-centered. And in order for that to happen, one of the first things that has to happen is that learners have to feel as though they have some kind of autonomy, some kind of ownership, because autonomy and ownership lead to agency. Right? And the first place they can do that, there's five, really five great areas that happens in. 
I'll give you the first four real quick. Time, team, task, technique, right? But one of the greatest ones is turf or space. And why that's so important is because it's so visual. So one of our rules is a 60 second rule. In 60 seconds, a group of five-year-olds should be able to transfer the, transform their classroom, pick up their furniture, move it to the things they need. Now, how, do I got elementary teachers in here? Okay, I'll, no, you know what, make some more noise than that, come on now, right? How many are first grade teachers? Oh, they're excited. Would you ever give your first, grade your first grade class and just say, yo, make what you feel. Good for you. I, I gotta be honest, I wouldn't. It scares me a little bit. <laughs> right, because you, because you have to structure some of that. Because if we wanna move, if we go back to UDL principles and tenets, UDL residuals, one of those is expert learning, right? Part of that is self-regulation, part of that is salient goal setting, right? Part of that, part of that is being resourceful and being pur purposeful. I would give them the bounded autonomy, saying we need this space to become a space where collaboration happens. We need this space to become a space where direct instruction happens. And then I'd let my, then you let your students pick up the furniture and move the furniture to what they need it to be. Right? That we call some people think that's flexible. It's beyond flexible. Flexible is when I make it as a teacher. That's teacher directed. I say, here's our collaboration space. You can tell because it's got some chairs that look like mushrooms and kids can walk, rock back and forth on them. Here's where we're gonna do some directed instruction. You know that because those are typical desks, right? And then here's the area where we're gonna do some more station learning. That's flexible and that's not bad, but the next place, the next step is how do you make it agile? How do you make it so that students, no matter what their age, can start taking over some of that ownership? And when they see they, ha they have that ownership, here are the first things that happen. Engagement goes up. Transitions from space to space, station to station, go down. And it doesn't matter if they're in, in pre-K, right? It doesn't matter if they're in first grade. It doesn't matter if they're in 12th grade. How many high school teachers I got? Woo right? How many 10th grade teachers I got? Okay, all right, so y'all know what, tenth, what sophomore means? Here we call them sophomores in, in this country. Does anybody know what sophomore means, the word? It's two words put together, sophist and morist, right? Sophist means wise. Mm. Morris means moron. <laughs> Yo, I got a 17-year-old son, or 16-year-old son. He definitely, he definitely still fits. He's a junior in high school. He still definitely fits a sophomore in many ways, right? But even, so when those students see that space and have that ownership, the same thing happens. They're like, wait, I don't know if I'm gonna sit down. I don't know what I'm gonna build. And then you give them that bounded autonomy within it. And they're like, oh, now I can build this, right? Now I, can, now I know what this area is for. Right? And then they start checking each other because they have ownership, they have community, they have connectivity, they have collaboration. They have spaces for critical thinking. Most importantly, they have spaces for creativity. They become, they're working along that expert learning continuum. How am I becoming resourceful? How am I finding engagement? And the transitions between those times start to, start to drop down. Another piece that we have is our rocker art. That's not it? That's not it? The rocker art is this guy right here. How many people sat on this? Yeah? Who wants to come stand up on it? Oh, really? Wow, okay, all right. No, we can't do that for liability. <laughs> I mean, you know, i, I just be honest. But, but if you've sat on the rocker art, how, how did it feel? Did it feel good? Yo, my boss is back there, just to let you know. How did it feel? Felt awesome, right? The best, right? The rocker art is, is the first product that was designed by Norvin Ivo. Right? And, and really, there's an interesting story behind it, but I'm, I'm not gonna bore you. Not bore you, but like, I'm not gonna take up my time with it. One of the interesting things that I love about the rock route when I first saw it was that I saw it like this. You all see it, it's just a cylinder, right? And I'm like, so what? Right? And then I saw this side. And once you cut off this side, so if it sits like this, how many ways can you sit on it? If the whole thing's round, you got two, right? You got, I sit on it here, I can sit on it here, right? Because otherwise it's gonna, it's gonna roll around. By cutting off one side, what happens? Now, right, that's one, that's two. You flip it over, it's two and a half, right? <laughs> or you can set it like this, right? Back and forth, just enough rock, right? So I've got some of these laying around my house, 
<clears throat> my daughter's 13 years old. She calls them rocker knots. And like she, the way she said it to me was hilarious. She's like, yeah, I know it's cool. It's called a rocker out, Dad, but what if you called it a rocker knot? And I was like, well, what do you mean, baby girl? Like, I don't get it. She's like, because you can either decide to rock or not. And like it was dripping with saltiness. <laughs> Just dripping. Right? So here's a rendering of one of our spaces. And as you can see, as we start building in pieces, here's pieces for collaboration. Here are pieces back here for collaboration, creativity. Here's one of my favorite pieces back here. Anybody see this one over on Universal B? Yo, I love the, I love the Copana. Why? Because it gives me the perception of space and being protected in a small space, but it's still open. It's a paradox of, of design, right? But it's a beautiful paradox of design. Let me show you another one. There's our rock rods again. Back here, you'll see one of our, one of our cloudy tables. Right? I'll get to the cloudy tables in just a moment. So under the, under the residuals, as I said before, it celebrates learner variability and ownership. I come into my space, I own my space. Right? It gives us bounded autonomy and agency. <clears throat> it's intentionally designed. Our products are intentionally designed. There we go. Like you guys have seen this, right? Yeah, right? Like, oh, create another one of those. Like, this is becoming like one of those images that when it hit, it was hot. And then, like, now everybody's like, oh, it's kind of like the ramp. Like, we all know the ramp one where the, where the kid's like, why don't you just shovel off the whole thing? And he's like, golly, Jim, you're right. Right? It's become that, but I want to look at it a different way. Right? <clears throat> so we, we know this, right? Equality, sameness, that's everybody gets this. Everybody gets fairness, right? Here's my big question as a, space, as a space designer. What happens to these boxes? And who's bringing them to the Major League Baseball game? Does, does, the major, does major League Baseball provide those? Right? Does this kid have to bring them with him on his bike? All of a sudden, that's a real problem, right? And then here's the other problem. What if he doesn't want to stand here, right? When you design the fence, you could have designed it and put the eye holes a little lower. I know they're not eye holes, folks. <laughs> I know. But you could have, or you could have, you could have, I don't know, you could have done something. Or, here's the fact of the matter, you could have just redesigned the fence. Because it's a major league baseball game. You are insane if you're going to let a bunch of kids sit in the outfield. <laughs> right? I mean, that's what I see in the picture. So you've got to design something. There has to be something that, that is there for protection. Right? But, but it's how you intentionally design that piece. Just like how you intentionally design your space, how you intentionally design the very things that you sit on. The tables you work with. How many people have been playing around with the cloudy tables? Yeah, I love them. Here's why I love them. It's not because I love clouds. It's, that's not why. I love them because this cloud allows me to do lots of things, especially if it's a flip table. I can have large space for collaboration, us standing together. But what if I'm one of those learners that's like, mm, I want to be near you, but I don't want to be with you, right? How many people have, have students like that or were students like that? Stand over here and you can do your work by yourself. But you're still part of the community. You're still bounded within the learning space with others and designing it, right? That's the intentional design that has to go into our learning spaces. How many people saw the Incupod that's out there? I'm going to wrap it up, but how many people saw the Incupod that's out there? Yo, I love the Incupod. Right? Because what happens, as a teacher of, of students in emotional dysregulation, one of the things that happened all the time, student would start, start dysregulating and finding, having to be, like, find a way to find, kind of bring themselves back. What's the first thing we say? Why don't we go get a drink of water or take a walk? Right? Well, what does that do? Yeah, that pulls that student out. Not only does it do that, it makes sure that everybody knows Brian needs to go get a drink of water. Right? You know that you've taken them for a walk. That's, that's what you're doing with that student. And as you're walking with them, you're talking and you're doing lots of great things, but you're still taking them out of the community. What the Incupod does is it allows for the, the beginning pieces of self-regulation. It just doesn't come. We have to test it out. It's a skill. You've got to build it. So a student can go into the Incupod. Or they can, can kind of have their break in the Incupod, right? And we can talk about the strategies that happen there. What do I need to do? Because on the inside of the Incupod, there's some whiteboards, right? You can put up some steps. You can write those steps in. The student can write whatever they need to write, right? Because it's a whiteboard. It'll all come off, 
right? And they can sit in that space, but they still are surrounded by their community and able to get to the resources of learning, but they're allowing themselves to break, right? Have a cloudy table that's there. You have a, you have a, a Jenga set, an amphi set right in the middle there where kids can come sit and they can, and they can talk with each other. Teaching, you can do teaching in, in, a, in a Socratic circle that's an actual circle, right? So for us, it's all about that design. And then the residuals of UDL start coming through. But then there's these, right? These are the skills for, for an exponential age. We live in it, like we wanna, how many people are talking about 21st century skills? Yeah, I, I, would, I would push you to think about them differently and talk about it differently because we live in an exponential age where the things that, that are going to happen, the innovations that happen, are happening at a rate that we've never known. So it is not about being able to grab the understanding. What it's really about is being able to handle the information, scaffold the information, work through the information, be able to do these things, connect with others and connect to technology, collaborate with others, cre be creative in your work, find community and build communities, be a critical thinker and a, and a problem solver, and communicate. None of those things are, are knowledge currencies, but they are all residuals of education through K-12 and beyond, right? Our, our, our furniture helps foster that in many ways, in many ways. So with that, I, want, I, I, I invite you, I could stand up here and I could keep talking, but with that I want to invite you to come out, come see us, come talk to us, explore the furniture like you have. But if you come and talk to myself or Jolene, um, <clears throat> we'll put a different frame on it. We'll ask you some questions, some design questions, right? Did anybody see the, by the way, just a uh, just random thought came to me. Did anybody see the design challenge yesterday with the kids? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Yo, some brilliant, I mean, the, the, and there were educators there as well. Where are the educators that were there? <laughs> They're like, mm, never mind. Like we're taking a break because <laughs> the furniture was heavy, right? But, but what was brilliant to see with those kids, and we'll have some video of that as well, what was brilliant to see with those kids is they came into their space and they're like, they're like we're going to grab this and this and this, and then they had to decide, do I have too much stuff in my space, right? Do I need to take some things out? All of that is critical thinking around their task that was at hand, and all of the furniture was built so that you can align it to your task, right, to your goals, right? So come talk to us, please. Uh, and, and come ask us questions, come get, get uh, my car, get my contact, uh, get Jolene's contact. She probably doesn't want me to tell you to do that. Uh, but anyways, reach out to her. <clears throat> and let's talk about what your space can do and how it can become your third teacher in the room. All right, here's our, here's our info. You want to find us on the Gram Gram or up on the Twitter? There you go. Come visit our website, download a catalog. I, by the way, I don't believe our catalogs are catalogs, I call them guidebooks. Why? Because we're a company that starts with education and we only do education. The beginning of the, cat, the catalog and the guidebook is all about pedagogy. It's all about pedagogy and then we take you on a tour of renderings. It is not about, we don't talk about product until we get back in page like, I don't know, 35, right? But come have a conversation. That's the best way for us to kind of explore things. All right, I'm Brian Dean, everybody. Thank you very much.